<coughs> okay. Forward. Let's test it. Forward. Backwards. Good. Okay. Great. Got it. Well, first off, I, I want to thank uh, Barry because it's uh, to a large degree we stand on his shoulders, but we stand on Ray Rogers' shoulders, and we stand stand on Dan Scavone's shoulders and Mark Marquardt. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of everybody. Uh, we're kind of at sea level here, and I'm going to take you back up for a 20,000 foot uh, view of things because we think we can clarify things uh, from that level for the new initiative to the Shroud. Uh, this document is not research. Uh, what we've tried to produce here is a summary for the 220,000 new births that occurred in the world today. We're 140 people here. There's 220,000 new people today, 7.3 billion in the world. Very few of them know any details at all about the Shroud. We have a formidable task ahead of us if we're to promote the Shroud to the world properly. And this is the group really to do it, because this is where the expertise and the insight lies. Um, we're kind of metadata, if you will, uh, to a lot of other resources. Uh, one I'd like to mention in particular is Barry's uh, tremendous resource of, a, of his archive of Shroud papers. Uh, we reference them copiously. Uh, what, we're, what we've tried to produce here, and you'll have to look at it to see if we've succeeded, uh, is a 20,000 foot uh, level in the Shroud that tries to create a summary of what is known for the new people coming to the Shroud. Uh, if you're lucky enough to attend one of the uh, lectures by uh, Russ Breault, uh, you're going to leave that with questions, as well as Russ does. Uh, we would hope Russ uh, would say, well, here's a resource, maybe read this book. There's a bunch of books you can read to, to fill in some of the gaps and to give you some security blanket that there is a narrative here. There is a, a, a way of understanding the Shroud that can lead you, potentially, to a position of authenticity. Uh, this document starts with that premise. It was formed by a group of people who have come to that judgment. We believe it's a rational judgment. Uh, in fact, very quick story, um, our first issue of this was back in 2013. Uh, this is only our second revision. We have been very quiet about the verse version we didn't advertise it at all. We just kind of put it out there and waited for comments. Many were adverse. Uh, we've worked hard to update it, and it's designed to be continuously updated. It's a living document. Uh, we're going to have a lot of work to do to absorb many of the things we've heard here this week, but we will reference them in there and then point to the papers. Uh, we'll re we will summarize them as best we can to clarify what was said. We may miss the boat, but we'll try to do that. Uh, just a quick note on how we got started. John Jackson, myself, uh, uh, Dan Spicer, a couple other guys from the, from the staff were sitting around at John's house after a meeting. And Dan Spicer, after a minute, said, you know, I have started doing shroud presentations at my church for different groups and to the Knights of Columbus, Catholic group that Dan belongs to. And he said, you know what we need? We need a truth table. And everybody kind of looked at Dan and said, well, that would be great. And then Dan said, but I've, I've got to start on it. And he pulled out one page, one piece of paper. And he said, let's do a truth table, a way of bringing people to understand that there's coherence in the story of the Shroud that can support a rational judgment of authenticity. It sounds like a formidable task. Here we are four years later. Dan has since moved to Williamsburg, Virginia and said, you guys carry on. But he was kind of the genesis of this whole effort. Let me just go through what we've attempted to do. In the preface, we say this, amongst other things. The purpose of the critical summary is to provide a synthesis of the Shroud, the Turin Shroud Center of Colorado, TSC thinking about the Shroud of Turin, and to make that synthesis available to the serious inquirer. We have to say that. What we would like to do is be in communion with this group, 
and others that read this document give us feedback so that we can keep it a neutral document and also update it continuously with a succinct statement of what are generally perceived and held to be the facts about the shroud. So we have to say this because if we make a mistake, we've got to take the heat. But we really want, want it to be more of a communion. We've talked to several people here that are out making presentations to people. Uh, we've asked Russ Real to give us feedback on it. Can he use it? Can he refer it to his people that come to us? his speeches and his, his presentations to say, well, here's another resource for you. We put it in the hands of several other people that I've met here, Mike and a couple other people that are out currently making presentations actively in the community. We'll even put a, a copy in uh, Dan Porter's hands so it would be nice to us. Dan, in fact, uh, did, did have many comments about version one of this document. Many of them were very helpful. Uh, they, they, they were comments on the blog of, of Dan Porter that were quite critical in, in many cases, but we took those to heart. We hope we've addressed the systematic problems that we've made in this document. Um, in our preface, we also thank uh, those people who contributed. Again, Barry Schwartz was uh, the source of all the shroud pictures, with very few exceptions that are in this document. <coughs> table of contents. From Dan's one-page truth table, we're now at about 109 pages. We'd like to keep it about that level, otherwise it fails to be a 25,000 foot document. It gets down closer to ground zero, and you see the kind of turmoil that can exist at ground zero. Uh, my brother-in-law, who's been a, a lifelong Christian, uh, knows I'm involved with the shroud, and he says, I'm not interested in the shroud, because every time I look up something, I'll find a wooden block explanation of the image, or a neutron explanation of the image, or a this or a that, it's all in flux. There is no truth to be grasped. Uh, we don't believe that. Uh, we think that, in fact, with a succinct summary of what is known about the Shroud, people can grasp that, deepen their knowledge by then going to the, to the source documents, either through Barry's resources, or if they need to buy a journal that's still behind a paywall somewhere. But you can come, and we, the five of us sitting there that night that Dan pulled that paper out, we agreed with him in one sense. We didn't agree with him that you could do it in one page. He didn't say that either, by the way. He said, let's get started. But we all looked at each other and we said, we've all come to this judgment that the shroud is authentic. And we believe in our hearts that that is a rational judgment. And then we had to look at each other and say, why? And can we communicate that to the new person that's looking at the shroud for the first time, or maybe just making inquiry? And we said, not only do we think we can, we must. Uh, there aren't too many documents like that out there. This is designed as a living document, kind of a, it's got a revision log. Every piece of evidence in there is given an ID number. It's built to evolve over time, keep up to date, be revised, but keep that coherence and a coherent story. So, table of contents. Historical evidence, uh, we've heard several excellent talks this week on that. Uh, we, we've worked with uh, Dan Scavone to get his documents he talked to you about today. We've had them in our hands. They're reflected in our document. So many things like that, we stand on the shoulders of those folks. But here's how it's organized. Historical evidence, medical forensic evidence, linen cloth evidence, image characteristic evidence. Then we go to the image formation hypotheses. That, and we, we have a criteria. Before we put them in the, in the summary, they have to have some traction. Uh, any presentation of an image for formation hypothesis that was made here this week has no chance of being at 20,000 feet yet. It won't be there until it's published. It's got some traction. It has some attraction from this community that says, yes, there's merit there. It goes through some review. And when it starts to get that, then we can lift it up and present it here. So we're, what we've tried to do is we've tried to have the best of class uh, competitive image formation hypotheses that are out there and evaluate them. Uh, 
a table. Uh, we kind of copied uh, Julia Fonti's paper. It's behind a paywall. I published it a couple of years ago in 2012. It was a compendium of an analysis of image formation uh, hypotheses against a list of uh, image characteristics that were all based on, uh, and it was mentioned again in uh, this meeting, uh, the paperback from, from the Dallas 2005, the evidences for testing hypotheses about the body image formation of the Turin Shroud, a document actually of the Shroud Science Group. So we're in, we are in conformance with that. We've made some strategic uh, decisions on how to arrange that, uh, those image characteristics, which I'll show you in a few minutes. We've got a concluding comment section. This is actually one page. Uh, appendix one, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that as we go through. But let me go through just a few slides. This won't take too long. Um, in the introduction, this is how we present the evidence. Every piece of evidence, now the historical section is not presented as evidence. It's presented as a narrative. And you can see why this morning. Uh, as you go back, we think that there's, a, there's an anchor point in Constantinople. We're committed to that. We believe that. There's an anchor point in Constantinople in 1204 that we can say not only historically but empirically there's evidence of the shroud being there. As you move back from there to the tomb, you get into the fog of history a little bit. There's narrative taking place. We heard some of that narrative this morning. Uh, there's conflicting, but, there's, but it, all along the path, there are these the pop-up of an image that looks like it's based on an, on an archetype. But we want to inform the new person that there is a chain of archetype signs back through that murky fog of history before 944, before 1204 in particular. Maybe it goes through Constantinople, maybe it goes through Galatia, maybe it goes through a gold box in the, in the, fair, in the uh, Constantin Constantinople royal palace. But there's hints of archetypes. So the, the historical evidence is arranged as a narrative. The other evidence, the linen cloth, the medical forensic, the image characteristics, we say is, is listed as empirical evidence and rated as such. So every piece of evidence, this is just an example out of the linen table. The evidence, the evidence is stated in bold, and I'll just give you an example. The Shroud Conservation Project of 2002, 2002 stabilized the layout of the shroud by stretching it out for flat storage. The reported post-preservation dimensions are approximately 442 centimeters by 113 centimeters, 14 feet 6 inches by 3 feet 9 inches. We'll rate that as class 1 evidence. And I'm not going to bore you, we've got three classes of evidence. Evidence, class 1 evidence is evidence supported by at least two published peer-reviewed, or at least close to peer-reviewed, because some of the documents here that are published here that we might want to list as being supportive of class one evidence might not be fully peer-reviewed, but at least two published uh, documents and papers supporting that fact. If, if it doesn't have that, it can't be class one evidence. Let me give you an example of class two evidence from the same table on the linen cloth. The pollen evidence. We all believe it. It's important. We think it's probably true. We hope that the uh, provenance of the tape samples and the way those samples were taken were properly cataloged, but we know they weren't. Uh, Julia Fonti talked about the need to retest that. We believe that. That's class two evidence in our table. Just so people know, you can't raise that, you can't raise that to the level of class one evidence in our scheme because there are not two published papers and there's some questions about the provenance. Although we all believe it's important evidence. Class three evidence is evidence that we, we put into this table for people to know about, i.e. flowers on the uh, coins in the eyes. They may be there, but we don't know. Uh, there's great dispute about that. That can only rise to the level of 
class three evidence. And then people don't have to pay much attention to it. Focus on the essentials that justify a rational belief that the shroud is authentic. Set aside some of the other discussion. Leave it aside. It's not really important for the discussion of rational judgment. It's important for, for a lot of reasons, and it may rise to that level. So we want people to focus on what we think is class one evidence. Every piece of evidence is given a, a number, and then any changes to the comments or the nature of that evidence over time is going to be documented in a change log, a revision log. So people can come back and say, gee, something happened to evidence L1 in 2014. What was it? What changed? Was there a new paper? What happened to, the, to this piece of evidence in 2016? Did it change its rating? Did it get upgraded? Did Pollen get upgraded after Bruno somehow magically decides that the Vatican can move and let us retest the Pollen? Hopefully so. Boom. Last one. Okay, so there's a change log that is always tied to this number. This number is a perpetual identification for that piece of evidence. The comments, uh, there's by nature going to be some parochial aspect to that, maybe that's good. Uh, but most of those comments come from the Shroud Center of Colorado as we understand the best way to clarify or, or pre present anything that we have any special insight in. So the comments are where we get a little bit of editorial uh, possibility. In the statement of the facts, we'd like to leave those as decided by the larger community. Okay, and then the references in uh, uh, the reference. The reference uh, part of the document is quite long because every piece of evidence references to the source papers where that doc where that evidence can be interrogated. Now you go to Barry's website or you go buy a paper from Applied Optics or you do something like that. So each pair of piece of evidence is individually documented in the references. Uh, I told you about, let's build a truth table, and then Dan moved. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> but thanks for the inspiration, uh, and, and the, giving us the courage to try to do this. Back to here. Um, I want to talk just for a second about uh, some other evidence. And this points out, we've heard about the print document, print manuscript, probably in 12 different presentations the last four days. Um, we have a, a, it's in the historical area, so there's no rating of this evidence. It's in there as a narrative. But here's the dilemma of my brother-in-law. If I tell him about the Prey Manuscript, or somebody just casually mentions it as evidence for the shroud, the Prey Manuscript's evidence for shroud, you take it as one piece of evidence, he hears about it, and goes where to find out? Where would he go? He'd go to the internet. And how many, how many potential hits will he get on the internet? When you pull up Google, it says, I've got how many articles related to this inquiry. Go, go do pre-manuscript. There's 2,300,000 different potential sites you can go to or in, in, uh, indexes in their database for the pre-manuscript. 2,300,000. Does that tell you maybe there's controversy? And then you start drilling down. Then you go to Dan. Forgive me, Dan, for a second. Then you go to Dan Porter's blog, and you say, oh, good, here's a trusted source. I'll inquire in pre-manuscript. You get nine different articles or blog entries and over 1,100 postings, comments. And you start going and reading them. You're going to go all over the board. And, and now you're a shroud neophyte, and now you're a shroud skeptic because you can't find any answers. So there should be a credible way. Dan's blog provides a tremendous resource for the Shroud community and those that already have a grounding of some basis. But don't ever tell a first person uh, that you've talked about the Shroud, oh, go to Dan Porter's blog and you'll learn about, uh, about the print manuscript. You just can't do it. You need to go to Dan's blog when you have some insight and you started to form a judgment, because then it's a rich field 
to participate in. Barry, that's, that's where you want your people to go next. So if we haven't told the story about the printing manuscripts, so go to our document maybe and go to the references in a, in a database like Barry's. Then go out into the public. But it's very, very difficult. I know most of the people here have spent years getting to the level of knowledge you have about the shroud. It's very, very difficult, trust me, in this electronic age, on your own, to ever reach a judgment. And the, and the default is always skepticism. To reach that level of clarity and to ever say, I've got a rational weight behind a judgment of authenticity on your own is virtually a 10 or 20 year project. And I've met a couple people here. Paul, for one, put your hand up, Paul. Here's a man who has endured and worked on his own. He's here as part of that search for clarity and finality of being able to reach that final judgment. It's very difficult. I salute you, Paul. Thanks for putting your hand up. There is a prototype uh, of, of how tough it is and, and how uh, doggedly you have to pursue this. And he's done that. It's beautiful, beautiful to see, but it's very difficult. So you almost need a document like this. Uh, I wish there were more attempts to build one. Um, we've at least attempted. Okay, pray manuscript. That was a minor point there. Uh, more about it, though, uh, in the history section and in the Lennon Kloss section. This is, happens to be a picture of John Jackson and his computer several years ago mapping folds on the shroud. And then we've got this document, which you've seen several times this, uh, this week also. We think this constitutes empirical evidence. Now in the linen cloth section, we have rated that as class one evidence. Others may not, and we respect that. But we happen to be in the home of the author of this one. So this one I put up here, because some people may say, well, how did, how did the Stroud Center of Colorado Springs rate the lifting device as class one evidence. We have the insight. Uh, we do. Uh, but other people have to interrogate that. But here's the, here's the beauty of a document like this. You can also kind of edit. There's several pieces of evidence as we get into the, the table that you can say, okay, I'll take that one and still reach rational certainty. Well, I'll make a judgment. I may never be certain but I'll make a rational judgment that the shroud is authentic, and then I'll reap the benefits in many ways. The, reaching that conclusion, by the way, is anybody in here, would they put their hand up if I say that? Reaching that position of saying, I believe I have a rational justification in holding the shroud to be authentic. Has that maybe changed your life? Would anybody put, put their hand up and say that? Judgment has changed their life. It does. Now, the beauty of a table like this is it maybe helps you uh, get started on that quest. And you can throw out specific items of evidence, but don't throw it all out. Keep going. So some people might not like the fact that we've rated this uh, class one evidence, but we're in the heart of the belly of the beast. I've seen those folds. I've seen the marks. I've seen the, the razor thin nature of those folds for the F block gives. I am, I am not only rationally convinced that the scheme is right, I've seen up, up close evidence and had it very deeply explained to me. I'm, I've been very lucky to be in the belly of the beast over here with John Jackson. <laughs> I meant that kindly, John. <laughs> okay, back to the table of contents. Image formation hypotheses. I don't know if you can read this Probably not, uh, but we've taken the image uh, characteristics, we've followed uh, the Shroud Science Group. You will probably agree with me, we've only included in image characteristics class one evidence. But we've arranged them in two categories. Image characteristics related to the cloth, image characteristics related to the body. Some of these things work together. 
It helps people to understand there's two classes of, of image characteristics, those related to the cloth alone, which tend to stand on their own. They, they, they're things like uh, light and dark, uh, high resolution. In fact, I, I can read them to you. Let me do that. Uh, front dark, same density. Now, all of these are explained back in that section. Each one has a, 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 a maybe half a page of explanation what these are, plus the references. But uh, image characteristics related to the cloth. Frontal dorsal, same maximum densities. Superficial image, superficial image, backside of the frontal, backside of the frontal. Double superficiality. We've rated that as class one evidence. Other people might not. Well, you can take that one out. But the point is, we try to give a, a rational way of looking at the image characteristics versus the image formation hypothesis. At 20,000 feet, let me tell you what we've, what we've arrived at. We've got two classes of image uh, formation that are natural body alone, two inconsistent. All of the artistic uh, mechanisms fail today. Uh, we got a new one this week, the wooden block. Let's see somebody publish a paper. We had a man with the courage to come in and present it, but then he left town. We didn't get to chat with him. Uh, I don't know if he was uh, April Fool's joke in October or whether that was a serious presentation. Let's assume it was. The next step for him is to publish a paper, give us something to work with. But we know that all the artistics fall out fall down when you get down into the blood image coordination. They just don't work. They, some of them don't work for, for some other reasons, but they all don't work for that. So you've got natural body alone, high inconsistencies, all the artistic methods. The one that's the closest, interesting enough, is uh, Alan's photo. The shroud is like a photo. We know his photo, the camera obscura, doesn't work. But when you look at all the image characteristics, the shroud, when you look at it this way, can this proposed image formation hypothesis work against the image characteristics? The photo comes closest, but it's artistic when it's not artistic. But it's a hint. Uh, back there, uh, John Jackson's fall through. Here's another Colorado Springs problem. Uh, The problem with Jackson's hypothesis is it fits all the image characteristics. And you might say, well, it's rigged. Of course it does. Because if it didn't, it just changed the miracle a little bit this way or that way. But John has been very sincere and honest. He's also, like Ray Rogers, a very thorough, truth-seeking uh, scientist. Uh, we have, in our document, given him consistent on the image characteristics. Well. That's controversial. But throw that out. The reality is you're not natural body. You're not artistic. You're out here in corona discharge or fall through hypothesis. You're something esoteric at a minimum, which screams what? Authenticity. You know, we can compete out here. But when you get out here, you've got a, a bona fide argument of authenticity one way or another. So even if you throw out Jackson's, it's this table draws you towards this, not artificially, but based on some analysis. Now, every point on this table, we've added an appendix, appendix one, which we did not have in version one, where every point on that table, we have a narrative of why we've given that grade. And I think many in this group would be very interested in looking at this. We think we have. A uh, very sound reason for every grade we give. Back, back here, uh, Appendix 1 is the rating details for the image formation hypothesis. You see it's, it's dense, it's an appendix, it's kind of technical in many respects. It's really not designed for the neophyte. Only if they want to go there. For this group, it might be where you go first to see are we really being honest? And have you really done your homework? We think we have. Uh, appendix 2 is a list of the 13 members. Uh, Barry had that. We thought it would be interesting. Uh, a lot of the research goes back to STIRP. 
And when you look at the, the quality of that team and where they came from, uh, it's impressive. Not from a conclusion point of view of what people might have individually concluded. We've seen differences. John Jackson's an authenticist. Uh, Joseph Asetta is a skeptic. But they were good scientists. They did good work. So it's important to look at who those people are, respect the results that they came up with, whether they end up being an authentic, authentic or a skeptic. They still did good work. And the credentials of, of that group were very impressive. The revision log uh, tracks all changes, uh, all substantive changes. If we make a typo correction or something like that, we don't necessarily document that. And then a, a long reference section. Quick advertisement. Where do you get it? Uh, you get it off of our website. Uh, it's here, Critical Summary of Observations. You can print it and make and distribute it. And we, we would want you to do it. If you're a person, how many of you go out and make presentations uh, around you? You can, you can print copies off if you find it useful, or you can refer people to it. Have at it. It's a tool. And if you use it, then start to consider yourself part of the community that will help us uh, maintain it. Give us feedback. Begin to own it with us. Uh, this isn't something that we really want to own. It's something that we want to serve the community by presenting. So if you're using it, get involved in helping us per perpetuate this. We would ask you to do that. Um, when we posted version two, uh, there are two things that work in the, in, uh, in the evaluation of all hypotheses that are out on the right edge. If there's radiation or an electric field or anything, there's questions about the vertical alignment of the image. Uh, we tried it. We said, well, if you're going to put that out there, you better put Jackson's hypothesis out there, too, to make sure that he conforms to that. But those are two interesting papers. It's great that Dorothy Crispino's uh, uh, Shroud Spectrum International is being brought in. Thank you for that, Mary, because a lot of very important papers are actually cataloged there. We don't put many on our website, but we've added those. Uh, and John has provided a new foreword to those papers uh, as well. Uh, concluding comments. Um, we hope we can be successful with this, but it's, it's going to be a, a joint effort. We're going to need your help. If you use it, find it valuable. If you find yourself saying to somebody that says, well, I heard you're uh, uh, involved in the Shroud of Turin, well, give them your five minute or 20 minute or two hour talk. But if you sense that it might help for them to go to a document such as this, then start to help us own it and make it a place that you're comfortable sending them. So if you find errors in here, if you think we've not put the right comment in, if you, if, if you strongly disagree, we, we think we've arbitrated the uh, ratings very well. We don't think you'll take any exception with those. In fact, you'll find that I think that we've been relatively conservative. Exception of one. Maybe two. There's still controversy about the double superficiality. Many believe it. Bruno, we need better confirmation. We have rated it as class one evidence. It means we, if there's more than one paper, there's good support. We believe it is a valid observation. And we've used it in evaluating uh, image formation hypothesis. You don't like that one? Well, then logically cross it out, look down, and see what it does to the conclusion of which image formation hypotheses are still valid. You're still going to be out here. And by definition, uh, authenticity position. There's another one we've included. This controversial still, and I've heard it mentioned several times this week image of bone and body structure on the shroud. We also believe that's true. Metacarpals, we somebody held up the, the bones and stuff. We've rated that as, now, one of the things that we've done that, uh, but if you look at it, that's one that, that I'd take out if, if you're at all concerned about that one. We think it's true. But look, it only works out here when you get way out here right now. Uh, Jackson's the only one that can explain it. But he explains it by explaining it. It works in his theory. 
in this hypothesis, but it doesn't work anywhere else. So if that's a valid observation, we think it is, then it narrows the gap. Here you go. Go ahead. Use it. Metacarpal. Thanks, Russ. Uh, <laughs> Russ talks about it many. We believe it's a valid observation. And we believe it. But <laughs> is the link to the article the same as it was for the first version? The link to to that page, the page address is the same because we linked to the first version. Yeah, no, that probably isn't very. Um, send me an email. I'll, give you I'll send you. I'll send you an email. But again, same thing holds. Take out, take out the bone. Take out that one. See what it does to the conclusions. It does nothing. To you're still out on the right edge of this curve. You're past the dead body alone. Obviously, that one doesn't work. But you're past that, and you're also past all the artistic message. You're still out in, by definition, authenticity position. <clears throat> Concluding comment. We feel justified in holding a position of authenticity. The evidence is there. Even though when we get into the fog of history, there's still narrative that has to be discussed. There are competing theories. There's this and there's that. There is this and there's that. There's lots of new developing information that just makes the strong case stronger. Uh, carbon dating, is it a problem? We don't think so. Uh, there's empirical and historical evidence that the shroud was in Constantinople in 1204. The carbon dating is anomalous. You don't have to criticize the labs. They tested what they had, but it's an anomalous result. We heard some intriguing from Robert, uh, some good ideas of, that should be pursued, particularly since it's a testable hypothesis. Why it might systematically be skewed. And a new carbon dating just makes it worse for us. So take our time in some of those things, but we think this could be useful, but join us in helping to make it useful. Thank you very much.